Hi there and welcome to The Telly Show. On this week's episode, I'm going to be chatting to comedian Kevin McGahern, who you'll know from his time as host of Republic of Telly, as well as Sim Card and Hardy Books, and loads, loads more I can tell you about later. First up, my TV picks for the week. It is with a heavy heart that I tell you my TV pick for this week is the final ever episode of Catastrophe. The Channel 4 comedy, written by and starring Sharon Horgan and Rob Delaney, sadly comes to an end this Tuesday after four seasons of what I can honestly say has been one of the best comedies we've had on TV in years. We do know the finale will see the couple deal with the death of Rob's mother, Mia, who is of course played by the legendary Carrie Fisher. In fact, Horgan has said the episode will be a little bit of a tribute to Fisher, while she also said the finale will be emotional and that it's a little longer than usual. Just saying it now, if Sharon and Rob break up, we will never forgive them. My second TV pick is as Irish as it gets. Dermot Bannon has a new show. Usually around this time of year, we are knee deep into room to improve, judging everyone's gaffes the usual. But this time, we've got a new series from Dermot on the way called Dermot Bannon's Incredible Homes. It will see the nation's favourite architect showcase some of the world's most amazing homes, heading to the likes of Sydney and London to see some very impressive houses. It kicks off on Sunday at half nine on RT1. My big interview this week, I'm delighted to say, is comedian, actor and TV presenter Kevin McGahern. Kevin has been doing stand-up for years, but he's also a familiar face on the small and the big screen. He presented Republic of Telly for five years. He's also known to many Hardy Books fans as Sim Card. And you may have seen him traipsing around America, Louis Theroux style a few years ago for some great documentaries for RTE. Not only that, but Kevin hit the big screen in 2017 to star in the independent feature film, No Party for Billy Burns. I had a chat with Kevin about all of this and more, including how he got started out, what he thinks of the comedy scene in Ireland at the moment, and how we are undoubtedly in the best country if there ever was an impending apocalypse. Uh, Kevin McGahern, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I was just saying it's the telly show. It's sort of similar to the Republic of Telly in title, but... bringing back a lot of painful memories. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Uh, first up though, you're on a massive tour this year for Solo Polo. It's huge! It's huge! Um, tell us about it. What is happening um, for people that are attending this show? What will they get to see of Kevin? Um, it's. I suppose it's mostly my... Um, my thoughts over the last two years of living in a world about to collapse. Um, but it's, a, it's a very, show. <laughs> it's an optimistic, it's optimistic, pessimistic view of the end of the world. Yeah. Um, God, it's it's the hardest thing to ever explain, like what a show is. Uh, but it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, it's sort of like I could describe it as like a man uh, in a car driving off a cliff, but sort of laughing. Right, manically. Ma yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of like, just fuck it. Yeah. Like, we're all going to die. Sure, we'll have a bit of crack before the end. Yeah, sure, why not? Why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the theme, I think, of the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how much have you done of it so far? Um, we've done about four four dates, I think, so far in Port Leash tonight. Um, so, yeah, it's been going great. Yeah, getting Response good reaction good. and stuff, I've yeah. got a good um, support act, Edwin Salmon. Oh, yeah, he's great. Um, from Bridget Neyman, who's my right-hand man. And it's uh, having a buddy with you makes it so much better. Does it? Oh, yeah. Because it's like you're, you're, you're on holidays by yourself, essentially. Yeah. And on holidays by yourself and then, I suppose, asked to be the best crack ever while yeah, you're on your own. Yeah, exactly. So um, it's nice having someone there with you to just go, like, was that any good? Um so it's like it's it's comical and emotional support that yeah. I get from my lovely bald friend. <laughs> yeah, it must be way better um, having a partner in crime on the night. Um, and then for you performing then, I suppose I've always wondered this with comedians, like having to kind of churn out the same material over and over again. Um, what is that like? I mean, I know it sounds like a basic enough question because that's what you do all the time. But. I do always wonder about when I go to see a good comedian, it's like, how do they manage to deliver this the same way they delivered it in like Castle Bar last night? And how do you kind of keep the enthusiasm for the jokes that you're telling? Great question. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Evan. For, <laughs> for, I think for normal stand-up when you're doing just like random sets, um, it can get monotonous doing the same thing again. You always want to do it kind of differently. But when you're doing a show, your end goal is to have a perfect product you know so you're constantly refining stuff and yeah. trying stuff seeing what works seeing what doesn't work you know it's like trump's speeches actually like the wall build the wall came from him just tossing out shit yeah. you know and that really worked 
So he's like, right, I'm going to say that again next week. It's the same with a comedian. Yeah. You try a joke, if it works really well, you keep it. If it doesn't, you let it die. Yeah. What's your build a wall joke then? <laughs> what is my build a wall? Um, it's, I suppose, yeah, the, the crescendo is uh, is dealing with an apocalypse in Ireland, what, what that would be like. Oh, yeah. And it's quite positive. Yeah. If, if I was to be in any country for the end of the world, this was the country I would really? be. Really? Yeah, 100%. Why so? I think we don't take danger seriously. I think we're um, impervious to terrorism because we none of us in this country take anything seriously, you know. Um, so I think that's that's how you beat the terrorists. Yeah. Is laugh at them. You know, when they come in with a bomb, pull their beard. <laughs> Pull their beard. Pull their beard. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, though, a massive session taking place in Ireland if we did get some kind of it would you know, be insane. apocalypse. Everyone paying a credit card. Yeah. Uh, just drink deals. Yeah. Because we're not allowed to do drink deals here. But who's smoking in pubs? Yeah. It would be the best the, crack we'd have since 1994. All the bread would be gone. But like, we'd have, yeah. Well, bread. hopefully, if we, um, in the next year or so, if we learn, learn to make bread, I hear humans used to do that. I believe so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was the mad thing about like when we had the big snow for three days, we ran out of bread and people are buying like 12, 15 loaves of bread as if like I think our entire economy is sandwich based. I know. Who uh, knew though? I yeah. saw a man in Tesco walk out with six loaves of bread. What's he at? Like, How many sandwiches is and that? And I thought the whole thing was just overly exaggerated and overhyped when people were talking about, oh, the bread thing. And then sure enough, in Tesco, six loaves. I was almost want to be like, what are you doing with them? Yeah, and then Please load, tell me you're feeding your lads, elderly neighbours. A load of lads uh, robbed a digger and broke into an Aldi. Like, that was... Yeah. Mi- we went from, like, society to Mad Max 2 in three days. <laughs> I know. It was a marvel what? to behold. Yeah. yeah. So apart from all the death... It'll actually be great crack. Yeah. Going back to Republic Italy then, mm. I know, <laughs> as much as you may not want to talk about it, but it was a huge <laughs> part of your career. Um, so I suppose I wanted to know, it was such a, I guess there's not really anything that's replaced it since. So I suppose, what was it like to work on it, considering it launched so many great comedy acts in Ireland? Yeah, and, apart from mine. Yeah, go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you feel about it cancelling? Um... Like it was a great, it was it was a great show to work on because it's great having that pressure every week to like produce something, yeah. and it's like it's it's manic at times, like where like you're pulling your hair out. But um, it was to be honest when it was when it was finishing up, I kind of felt it had its day anyway. It was a slight relief. Yeah, there was a comfort there. You're like you've got a regular gig, mm. but uh, I mean I'm not sure how long I could have gone on anyway I think five years I was like I, I did it the longest you did the longest yeah and all of them. Um, after five years you're just like okay I do want something different you know? yeah. yeah that show then like that was again I was so focused on just like taking the piss out of telly then mm. but I was reading recently that if you were to go back into t- television or anything like that you would definitely want to go into a more political comedy route well I, yeah cause, like there's only and I remember Dermot Whelan said the exact same thing there's only so many times you can make fun of Fair City yeah, um, there is so much material with diversity. <laughs> with with all the stuff that's going on in the world, like it does feel um, a little bit trite to like be making fun of some lovely actor from Fair City who's just doing his job. Yeah, absolutely. when there's just so many bastards out there that you really want to take down. Yeah. So yeah, political satire has always been. It's always more rewarding. Because you really want to stick your knife into some of them lads, you know. Yeah, and I actually do find it very frustrating at the moment in Ireland that there's so much going wrong, mm. and we've got no political satire, no we've got, comedy. We've got Waterford representing Whispers. It. Waterford Whispers is the only thing really the that I can thing, think of. But nothing on television that's you know, I mean, even the likes of John Oliver or someone like that who can do political yeah. satire, blue political comedy, but also kind of inform as well. And that's just so lacking in Irish television at the moment. Yeah. So when I was reading that about you wanting to do political comedy, I was like, yes, somebody needs to like you know, start pointing out things and educating people through comedy about the different problems with the government and what's happening in Ireland. Exactly. It's um, like I'm addicted to like the American um, talk shows, the because they've got a lot more since Trump got in, I guess. Yeah, they've got a lot more political um, like Johnny Carson, that era, they would never you never knew how they were going to vote. Uh, they would come out and they would make fun of Democrats, they'd make fun of Republicans, mm. whereas now it's I imagine it's, it seems quite one-sided for Republicans, but they're so much easier to make fun of. Yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, we need we need something like that. Um, yeah. Now, there's probably not enough going on in just Ireland to just make fun of Irish politics, but if you 
make fun of world politics and yeah. then have little bits of Ireland. I mean, of Ireland, Ireland the UK, I mean, yeah. you could expand from there. Exactly, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, get someone to commission that. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Green light that show, damn it. They, they're not watching this. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't they? Oh, <laughs> gosh darn. <laughs> no, the chief commissioning editor of RT is not. Just perusing the internet, watching interviews. <laughs> you don't know that, Kevin. You don't know that. <laughs> um, and I suppose at the moment for comedy in Ireland as well, what do you think of how the comedy scene has evolved in Ireland and how it is right now? Do you think it's in good shape? I think it's in. Uh, I think it's in pretty good shape. I think we've like even from when I started, there's there's a lot more women doing it. Yeah. Um, like we're not at fifty fifty yet. I'm not sure if we ever will be, because I think comedy tends to attract more men, um, or at least I think men suffer from overconfidence more than women. Mm. Women are a lot more self critical, so they're less likely to say, "Hey, I'm a funny bitch," and go up on stage, whereas. Everyone knows that guy in the office who thinks he's hilarious. Um, he will try comedy. So I think there's always going to be a slight imbalance. A lot of comedians give out about the, um, oh, you can't say anything anymore, which I don't think is true. Um, you can say stuff, just make sure it's funny. Uh, like when I started, there was a lot more of um, kind of misogyny, uh, kind of blatant racism at times. Um, and that's kind of not on anymore, but it doesn't mean you can still talk about those issues. You can still talk about race, you can still talk about sexism, uh, you can still talk about homophobia. Mm. Just make it funnier. Yeah. You know, and make sure you know who the target is. You know, I think that's that's what's died is you're not allowed to do comedy where you're targeting a minority, but you can make fun of yeah. the issue. You know what I mean? Because I was going to ask you that as well. There's sort of that kind of thing now with comedy of editing or self-editing. But it's good, as you said, that there is, yeah, like there is ways of tackling there's, it. There's things, when I started in 2009, there's was, there was things in my set that I wouldn't do now. Like even like the use of the word junkie. Um, or even if you're using it in an ironic way, the F word for describing homosexual men. Mm. Um, I would not do that now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a bit of censorship is, is good. It's a yeah. good thing. Like, yeah. people give out about political correctness, but it's better to have it than not have it. Yeah, you definitely. Know? Yeah. If it stops kids getting bullied at school, it's probably a good thing. This is it. Mm. Yep. Um, and speaking about your start in comedy, you apparently went out and did secret gigs, I've heard, at the beginning, with telling your friends or family. Oh, or, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> You're like, I did. <laughs> we just, I this, told the you, the for this interview, you talked to your primary school teacher. <laughs> <I've> <laughs> done a lot of research. But when you began in comedy like that, as you were saying, there is that kind of feeling that men have of like, yeah, I think I'm a funny fecker. But yeah. when you were starting off, what was your draw towards comedy? And how did you sort of start feeling confident in yourself to go on stage? Um, I was, uh, I, I studied animation. Oh, yeah? Because uh, I wanted to make cartoons. And I was in college with a guy called Robbie Bonham, a uh, comedian, mm -hmm. who um, he just seemed so lackadaisy about it. Like I was asking him all these questions. I didn't know that I wanted to do it. Yeah. But I was asking him all these questions about comedy and he would bring me to gigs and I would ask the other comedians. And he was like, just do it. Like, stop asking me questions. Yeah. It's no big deal. Yeah. So I... The Hapenny Bridge Inn is pretty much where everyone starts. Yeah. So I would go to these things and like... People who had never done comedy before would get up and they would have brought like 15 friends from work and their brothers and sisters. And I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> are you insane? What if you fail on your arse? They will know this for the rest of your life. So I told nobody. Like, I just tell my, uh, my current wife, my girlfriend at the time. That sounds weird, my current wife. My current wife. Uh, my wife. <laughs> my, my wife my, for now. My girlfriend at the time, my wife now. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> I was like, I have to go out, okay? And she was like, all right. Like, right. I'll tell you about it later, okay? But I, I, I just don't want to really tell you where I'm going. And <laughs> it's kind of good that she wasn't that suspicious. She was, she kind of knew. She trusted you. She was like, all right, I think, I think he's doing stand-up comedy. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, I waited until, I basically waited until they found out, until my friends were like, hey, are you doing stand-up? I've seen your face on a poster, you weirdo. Yeah, yeah. Because I just, I didn't want to fail in yeah. front of my friends. It's the worst feeling in the world. Really? Yeah, I did a corporate where I just died on my arse and my cousin was there 
And every time I see him, I just think, I bet you're thinking about that now. Yeah, that's <laughs> all you can think about. Not my successes, just yeah, that one yeah, time. Yeah, just that horrible <laughs> failure. Um, and of course, comedy and stand-up that led you to Hardy Books. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any talk of that coming back again? Or I don't know. Like, I mean, it's such a weird thing where they like give them a series like once every two years. What's that about? I think they're doing like a boyhood thing where they want to, <laughs> want to make Hardy Books every four years <laughs> until they're like last of the summer wine yeah. age. Yeah. Yeah, in their or 50s, dead. sitting in there. Oh, it's in their 80s. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's still, still, it's, still talking about going to Galway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Saving up 30 euro to go to Galway. Um, it must have been, because that show when it first came out was so so talked about, so, or so many people watched it, talked about it, were quoting it. Uh, it must have been great to have been part of it. And was it fun to film? It was. I, I felt like the more, obviously, the more scripted it got, the harder it got for crack. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, most times it was there was very little difference between what was going on on screen and what was going on behind the cameras. Really? It was, it was just a big, dirty session constantly. Um, and this, the, the, like the lads are very similar <laughs> to their characters. Yeah, yeah. So Some I different did. different accents, that's yeah, about it. <laughs> a very, not even that different. Um, Martin's a bit different, all right, and Chris. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to work on. Yeah. And it, I always looked forward to like those four weeks of just living in a tiny town of Mayo and just getting mad over every yeah. single night. <laughs> like, <laughs> and just doing weird stuff, yeah. It was good yeah. fun. And then uh, finally then, the documentaries I also really enjoyed a few years ago from you. Um, they were, saw you going to America. You were in America kind of just pre-Trump time as well. Yeah. I'm so annoyed because I talked, we talked to so many, we talked to like 100 people at yeah. least. And I'd say 80% said they were voting for Trump. Now that's obviously because of who we were. We are talking to gun nuts and... yeah. Uh, you know, people who Republican. stockpile ham in their shed to wait for the apocalypse. But every even like waiters and waitresses and like people on the street, everyone was voting for Trump. Yeah. And I remember coming home, it's like, I'm going to put money on this dude. And then when I turn on the news, um, everyone was saying, oh, no, it's turned now. It's back to Hillary. And I was like, oh, not bother. Yeah, yeah. So I should have done a George Hook and stuck a hundred quid down on him. You should have. Yeah. At least there would have been some bonus for him becoming yeah. president. But it, it was, yeah, it was... It's such a mad place. Yeah. It's such a mental place. Because I guess you'd seen, like, I've been to America, but I haven't been to those parts of it. That, you know, I've been to New York and California, but I haven't really spent a lot of time in kind of... In the main part of it. The main the part middle, of yeah. it. Yeah. It's, it's but with so many people, totally I think, are like that. It's a whole, and it's always that thing of America. How could America have voted Trump in? But it's like, I'm sure we don't know half of America. Like, it's, we don't know. And it's like half America is, um, it's, it's like a third world country, like... Really? Um, yeah, like the, some of the poverty in middle of America is would shock you. And I've just, I find it so frustrating watching them because they're constantly voting against their interests. It's like all Americans are like this, they've got this thing in their head, like they're temporarily embarrassed billionaires. Someday they're going to make it big. Yeah, the American and, dream. And that's why you can't tax the billionaires because I might be one someday. Right. And you're not, man. You're not. Yeah. <laughs> you're really fucking not. And would you go back there? Would you consider doing? Um... In a New York minute. Really? <laughs> yeah. If this website wants to pay for me yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to like interview the strangest people in the planet, 100%. Yeah. Nice, nice. That could be our next online project. There was one guy when we were, we were staying at this um, house in the middle of Florida in like a swamp. And it was a party house. Um, and it was... <laughs> It was a house where they would you basically you would pay to party with them with right. these party boy lunatics, and like the jackass lads were there and Andrew W K is that his name, um like all these crazy party dudes would go to this house and pay this guy and they would just go mad and he yeah. had like strippers, it was disgusting, uh, like there was bras stapled to the wall there was like um, sex toys stuck to the wall it was like the most I felt like sticky walking into the place. Yeah. This guy, he his name was Busey. Um, I think he was a relation of Gary Busey. Mm. But um there was this guy called Big LA and he was he was the the fattest man I've ever seen in my life. He was like American fat. Yeah. Another way like Irish or British people when they get fat they kind of just turn into big barrels of Guinness. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, whereas Americans are like just pff, like uh, cling film full filled with like butter. Yeah. Um, this guy showed me how he could hide a gun in his fat. Oh my god! And he lifted up his. He was wearing just a pair of pants. <laughs> he lifted up his fat and he took out a pistol. Oh my god! That's the most American thing I've ever that's seen. That's the most American thing I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, big LA, look him up. <laughs>
But yeah, that was that was the funnest, weirdest, scariest place, I think. Yeah. They were sounds... just like, we were outside just shooting um, M16s just yeah. into the into I think Because I did blades. watch your show. This does ring a bell. I can picture it all too clearly. So I think I did see this episode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was my favorite one. The, yeah. the one on sort of outsiders, um, people who have left their family to kind of forge a new weird yes. family. Yeah, yeah. Because that's, that's the story of America. America used to be in our family in Europe. Mm. And then they they were like, nah, we want to do things differently. Yeah. And then they just section off. Like the whole, the entire country is filled with people who just want to do things a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah. Which is why there's so many different types of Protestants. Yeah. <laughs> interesting, <laughs> interesting place to be. An interesting place to end the interview. <laughs> Kevin, best of luck with the show and everything else that's coming your way this year. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> That's it for me. I hope you enjoy the show. Remember, you can listen to the interview of Kevin on Omni, Spotify or iTunes as a podcast, as well as the rest of the telly show interviews to date. Thanks for watching.